Hi, I'm Sarah Field, and I am a vice president with Stand Together, a community of organizations that is dedicated to tackling the biggest issues that individuals face in society today. And we are thrilled to welcome two amazing guests to today's discussion to discuss an issue that really hasn't gotten the level of public attention that it deserves, especially during COVID. And this is the matter of high prison phone call rates that make it pretty much impossible for many individuals to stay in contact with their loved ones, with their friends and family while they're behind bars. So as I mentioned, we have two wonderful guests who are going to speak to this issue from their respective vantage points. Our first guest is Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai. Um, and Chairman Pai recently enacted a measure to curb interstate calling costs for those who are currently incarcerated. And he did this through a proposal, it's, it's a little technical, but it essentially prevents providers from adding service charges on top of the interstate um, FCC designated rate cap. So thank you for joining us today, Chairman. Um, and we're excited to learn a little bit about why the FCC uh, and you tackled this issue. And my second guest is my friend, Sean Pika. Um, Sean is the executive director of Hudson Link just a phenomenal organization out of Sing Sing Prison and several others that equips incarcerated individuals with critical life, education, and reentry skills. Uh, Sean has an amazing story. He himself was incarcerated as a teenager and used his time while incarcerated and then all of his time since then uh, to help those around him and make the world a better place. So Sean, thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Honored to be here. Thank you. So just for a little bit of context for the people who are watching, uh, during COVID, we've all obviously felt very acutely the pain of being disconnected from one another and, and those physical barriers. But for most of us, we've been able to use great technology solutions to close those gaps, right? Even as the three of us are talking right now on, um, on Zoom, uh, that's what so many friends and family across the world have been able to do. But for those who are incarcerated, and for their families, this physical separation has in many cases been an insurmountable barrier. And one of the main drivers for that is the high cost of calls uh, for, for reaching loved ones behind bars. Um, and so for many years, um, you know, again, these barriers have prevented individuals from staying connected. And this is problematic on so many levels, but particularly in the way in which we know connectivity contributes to positive reentry experiences for those individuals and for the families and the communities into which they re-enter. And of course, COVID has exacerbated all of this. So Chairman Pai, why don't I start with you with my first question. Um, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about these costs. For most Americans, they just probably have no idea that this is even a thing. Um, and the costs, I believe, typically range from about 10 to 15 cents a minute. So how did, how did we get here? It's a great question, Sarah. Before I answer it, though, let me just thank you for hosting this conversation. It's an important topic that often has slipped through the cracks in the mind of the American public. And Sean, thank you for the great work that you're doing. Thank it's you. incredible uh, in, your, in Sing Sing and just across the country, how many advocates like you are making a positive difference. Uh, for me, at least, I approach the issue this way. Uh, most of us are in favor of free markets. And you know, if you want to buy a wireless phone, for example, you pick your provider, you pick your phone, you pick your service plan that works for you, and then you're off to the races. You can call or use data as you wish. But when it comes to calling from uh, prisons, uh, there's nothing about this market that is free. In fact, it's not even a market. There is no competition because a lot of states and localities will have exclusive contracts with providers and the rate regulation for some of those providers on an interstate or even an intrastate level, that is between states or within a single state, are unbelievably high. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the things that we've noticed is the interim rate cap for interstate calls at the FCC is something like 21 cents per minute for prepaid and debit calls, 26 cents per minute uh, for collect calls. That's very, very high. That's part of the reason why we've looked to aggressively attack those based on some of the evidence that's in our record. But on the interest state side, it's even higher. In fact, the FCC staff at my direction compiled information from all the states. And we found that some states have rates that are more than twice of what the interstate cap is. And some states allow first minute charges, that is the first minute of that phone call, that are 26 times higher 
than the interest rate rate. Just think about that. And think also about the fact that these high charges are falling on those who are disproportionately lower income minority, those least likely to be able to afford it. And as you framed it very well, Sarah, especially in the midst of a pandemic, when prisons in particular have been affected by social isolation, I think that connection with those on the outside is more important than ever. And that's why I think it's important for regulators like me and for advocates like Sean and you to stand up and say, this is an important issue. It's, I know some people want to say, well, there's some prison, who cares? But it's a matter of justice for those individuals and their loved ones. And as a society, we are much better off when those who are incarcerated feel that connection so that when they come out, they don't feel like society has been arrayed against them. And now they're going to take it back out on society. They need to be integrated like any fully functioning member of society should be. No, absolutely. That's, that's a great perspective. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you walk us through just a little bit of details about what, what this looks like in practice in terms of what the FCC did? Absolutely. So we recently adopted my plan uh, called the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that took a comprehensive look at this marketplace and said, you know what, these inter interim rate caps that we inherited are just too high. Based on the evidence in the record from some of the providers that we've gotten and studied very carefully, we think this 21, 26 cent per minute framework is much too high. So we've proposed a 14 cents per minute for prepaid debit and calling uh, and collect calls and as well as 16 cents per minute for all other calls. We recognize that's still high for many of these low income uh, incarcerated individuals and those on the outside. We wish we could go lower, but based on the evidence in our record, that's the lowest we could feasibly go without being challenged in court. In addition to that, we set for the first time rates, uh, rate regulation for international calls. And uh, one of the things I should note is I mentioned interstate calls. That is what the FCC has jurisdiction over. Under the law, we don't have jurisdiction over calls purely within one state. Unfortunately, those intrastate calls are 80% of the inmate calling services market. So what do you do? Well, one thing you an FCC chairman could do is throw up his hands and say, oh, it's not my problem. That wasn't good enough for me. So in July, I sent a letter to the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARUP. They represent all the state regulators around the country. And I said, this is an important issue. You need to step up and tackle this rates. And they took a look at it and said, you know what? You're absolutely right. Those state regulatory commissions that have authority will look at the problem. And they asked me, and I agreed recently, just last month, to send a letter to the National Governors Association telling all the nation's governors in those states where the government has not given the State Regulatory Commission authority to regulate intrastate rates, you, the governors, need to stand up and take action on this issue. It's a serious public safety matter and a matter of justice. Yeah, that, that's that's so wonderful because you know even in areas where uh, the FCC may not have the authority to act, you're still using your position as a platform to encourage others to step in and, and solve these challenges, and that's just so encouraging to hear. Um, so, Sean, I, I want to pivot over to you for a minute. Um, you spent several years behind bars, as I, I mentioned earlier, and so you saw firsthand what what the emotional impact can be um, of, of these high rates and how they impact people's ability to actually stay connected with their loved ones. Can you tell us a little bit about what that actually looks like? Can I just quickly say thank you to Ch uh, Chairman Pai? I mean, even if this is not successful, even if you don't win this, for those men and women incarcerated around the country to know that you're advocating on their behalf and, and they don't even know you for their best interest, for their family's best interest, it's just such a powerful human move that sends such a clear message that they're not alone out there. It's, it's so important. Thank you. It's really a big deal. Okay. For me, I, I, at 16, I was arrested. I was sentenced to 24 years in prison as a teenager. I get to that first prison. It's the largest cell block in the country. I, I literally, two football fields long. You can't see the end of it. And I just feel super alone. The only thing that I have access to is to write or receive letters or make a five minute phone call once a month. Number one, most of the men and women don't know how to read or write. So that letter is nearly worthless. I went in in the ninth grade, so I was able to read and write. Um, I not only was able to write and receive letters, I helped other men learn to write and receive letters, which was really a big deal for me personally to find value when I really just thought my life was over. But to know that you could only get on the phone for five minutes once a month and you don't even do it because you know your family can't afford to pick it up. And, and the scenario is you get online, you wait, you get your turn, 
you dial the number and then you hear the person pick up a brother, a mother, a cousin. And they, and it says the person calling is from a correctional facility. Would you accept the charges? And you hear them say, no, no, I can't. And they hang up. It is the worst possible feeling. You know, you think prison's rock bottom. No, no, it's not. It's, it's times like that, that you realize what real rock bottom looks like. Yeah, that's um, just the thought of having to hear your loved one say no is, um, is heartbreaking. Um, Sean, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chairman, I'll, I'll go back to you. Um, you mentioned for a moment that um, keeping the caps at a certain point um, would really help in terms of um, this being challenged in the courts. And so, so just for the context for people listening, this isn't the first time that the FCC has really uh, tried to step in and solve these challenges, but previous efforts uh, were struck down by the courts for overstepping the agency's authority. And so uh, just a little more detail on why do you think the approach this time is going to be successful? I do uh, hope and expect it will be successful and hopefully we'll be able to vindicate uh, Sean's powerful witness to uh, the fact that we are all social beings and especially those who are in a state of isolation like that. Uh, that might be the connection that almost literally saves your life in many cases. And so that's why we want our proposal, which reduces these caps by 24 to 44% on net, will stand up in court. Over the last decade or so, the SEC has wrestled with this issue. Some of the providers and others have taken it to court. And four times, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit has struck down various aspects of the FCC's authority or decisions in 2017, notably saying we didn't have authority at all over intrastate issues. And so one of the things I told my team was, look, I understand that we want to go as far as we possibly can, but let's find the data and let's craft an order that will stand up in court no matter who challenges it. And I'm very confident that this one will because we gathered all this data from the providers. The providers have told us, you know, these are our costs, that these are some of the other charges that we impose. These are what some of the state and local governments charge us called site commissions uh, in order, and we have to pass that cost on. And so taking into account all of that data, that's how we came up with these rates, which we think are sustainable. And the last thing we want is for us to go to court a fifth time or even another time after that and have to wait longer to deliver what is called phone justice. In the words of my uh, distinguished uh, counterpart, uh, Mignon Clyburn, a commissioner who led this effort for many years at the commission, uh, you know, she's aptly called it that. And she's absolutely right. At, at the end of the day, what we want is you know, to find the rates that are going to be sustainable. And so I very much hope that we're able uh, to do that. And especially working with some of these state and local authorities, it's going to be absolutely critical. One gap I will say is in terms of the site commissions, this is an area where Congress could step in and give us more legislative authority. As for those of you who are watching who don't know, essentially what happens is uh, a county typically will offer, will put out a request for proposals. Okay, who are the providers who want to serve this jail or prison? Uh, and once they select a provider, the county will say, okay, well, you've got to pay us a site commission, essentially extra money on top of you know, the cost of providing service. And we're gonna use that for anything from police cars to computers at uh, the jails or whatever it might be. It doesn't have to relate to the call, uh, the, the inmate calling services at all. And so this fees can be pretty, the site commissions can be pretty exorbitant and that cost is passed on through these rates. So that's one of the things we need to be able to crack down on is site commissions that have nothing whatsoever to do with inmate calling services themselves. That's really helpful to understand, thank you. Um, Sean, another question for you. Um, you know, one of one of our assumptions is that that by reducing these these costs, it's going to help yield more connectivity between incarcerated individuals and their families. Um, and so, question for you, um, not specific to the individuals, but to the to corrections departments generally. What do you think are some of the changes that we would see in corrections departments if we saw this change to the phone call rates and we see this increased connectivity with people on the outside? A place like Sing Sing um, in A Block Yard, for instance, hundreds of men are out there on any given day. Um, the, there's a phone bank, you know, 14, 15 phones, looks like pay phones, but they have to dial in to use collect. It's the only way you can make a call is collect call. They're generally empty. So to think of a hundreds of men that would do anything to talk and connect with their family and their wife and their friends, can't even pick up a phone that's right in front of them. And, you know, it's not a phone line, it's a lifeline. This is literally the connecting piece 
the high rate of suicide, the connection to families that have not been with you. I mean, I was there for nearly two decades. I'm one of five boys. I'm the only one that went to prison. My mom and dad are retired New York City cops. I'm there. They want to be supportive. I can't connect with them to talk about what my next steps are, what I'm doing on a daily basis, what I want to do when I get out, to make those plans. Without that connection, how am I expected to rejoin our communities in a positive way and be a positive part going forward? Like, how do I plan my future? 68% of the men and women in this country return to prison after the first three years. That's a horrible, horrible number. If we know we can do one thing to lower that number and increase my chance of being a successful part of our communities, that makes everybody's life better. And this is such a small piece to ask for. Chairman, I mean, the, what you're asking for to me just seems like such a small commitment from these providers. They're making so much money to give this one, the most vulnerable population, that any of us work with, to give them a chance to connect better with their families, how is that being denied? No, that's exactly right, Sean, thank you. Um, so, so I have one last question for both of you. Um, both of you are extremely busy individuals with a lot of things that you could be doing with your time. And so I would just love a personal word on, um, you know, why this? Why, why, why are you passionate about this? Um, and why did you take the time to be with us today? Chairman, we can start with you. Well, I, I mean, I will say that we have a lot on our plate at the FCC, but you know, one of the things that I've realized in this job is that you're not called to bunt or go for singles here and there. You've got to swing for the fences. And when it comes to swinging for the fences, you've got to pick causes that are really important, that deliver for those who don't have a voice for themselves, who can't advocate for themselves, who are stuck in this limbo. And you know, this issue is a great example of that, where you have millions of people who are never going to be on the front pages of the newspapers, or probably not going to be featured on the cable news networks, but who nonetheless have needs that are screaming out for somebody in a position like mine to, to, to vindicate. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. And I'm struck by all of these stories I've heard, in particular one I heard last month about a gentleman who, thanks to the work of the Innocence Project, was freed from prison after being wrongly convicted for something like 26 years. And what was amazing was they asked him, the reporter asked him, what are you looking forward to the most from uh, after getting out of prison? It was amazing. He said, a walk in the sun, a meal in my home, and not having to make a phone call with five other per people just sitting a few feet away from me at a phone bank. That is incredible. I mean, just the very basic things that we take for granted living in the environment that most of us live in, it's it just something that he really treasured. And he was deprived of that for a quarter century. Many, many more Americans have been deprived of that as well. And so I think it's just important for people like me to do what we can within the law, to use the bully pulpit where we don't have any authority, and ultimately to deliver for people like Sean's delivering for, uh, to deliver phone justice for them. Sean? I think um, just going into prison so young, uh, you know, I was 16 when I got arrested and, and sentenced to 24 years in prison. Um, the older men that were already there, the officers, the staff that really wouldn't let me fail. They, they just guided me and they assisted me and they mentored me, many of which are still there. And I, as I left that place, I really felt like I needed to dedicate the work that I was involved in. Like you said, Chairman, whatever that work might be, I needed to dedicate myself to a work that would pay that forward. And I feel like between um, the creation of housing for phony incarcerated people, between the educational uh, attainment for the men and women that are coming home, we've lowered that rate from 68% across the country to less than 2%. And having partners in that work to know that this is not some magical moment. We're literally just educating an uneducated population and the, the amazing statistics are right in front of us. And having this phone connection with a family member while doing these other pieces, this is just a win-win for everybody. Well, thank you to both of you. Um, and thank you so much for your time today and all that you're doing to um, 
to, to be a voice um, for those who don't necessarily have a voice otherwise. So thank you. Um, if you're watching today and you are interested in learning more about um, these issues and other criminal justice reform issues, I would encourage you to go to the website of Americans for Prosperity, which is part of the Stand Together community, www.americansforprosperity.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chairman. Hey, thank you. God bless you both. Thank you. You too.